Good morning. I'd like to begin by first acknowledging the Tiwa, the Tewa, the Toa, and the Kuris speaking people of this region. And so in that regard, I'd also like to offer my greetings, San Gitamo, is that correct, Laura? Osio, Buzu, Sego, Ang, Yate, Shee, the manual lead, but so in Shia, Kenya Anid, Nishlino, Hashlishi Bashin, Sitna Jenny, the Shichena Hobani, the Shanala, Nashre, Ea, Nasha, Adishi Yahoa, Ad Thoa Ilha, Thoa Jed, Thoa Ilha, a lead us in the little Thoa Ilha, a Yaj Nishlino, a Da Nishlino, a Tselin Nishlino, a Na Nishlino, a Che Nishlino, a Nala Nishle. Without an I'm originally from Nashchiti, New Mexico, which is about three and a half hours from here, maybe four, depending on the route that you take. And it's located between Gallup and Shiprock, if you've been on 491, the newly constructed four lane highway. So that's where I'm from. I grew up there and I attended school at Nashchiti Elementary School, attended high school in Tohatchee. I attended a few years at New Mexico State University where I received my associate's degree and then I transferred to the University of New Mexico where I received my Bachelor of Science degree. And being adventurous, I decided to go to the East Coast for my graduate degrees. And I attended Harvard, the Graduate School of Education. I received my Master's in Higher Education Administration. And I decided to test my marketability and I stayed on the East Coast for quite some time. And so I spent most of my adult life in Cambridge and in Boston. And I've always done this type of work in terms of social justice and access and equity. I never really called it diversity, equity, and inclusion until it was pointed out to me. But my interest in this area really came about from two different areas. Upon completing my doctorate, I started looking at different opportunities and ways in which I could have an impact on genetic and genomic research. And at the time I was directing a genome sciences program for minority training or minority students who aspired to pursue biological sciences at Harvard. And I'm not a geneticist, but I did realize that through bioethics, which is interdisciplinary, I started looking at the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetic and genomic research within indigenous populations. And so that took me to Georgetown for a faculty position. And I realized that there was this opportunity and there was this gap where we don't have enough indigenous research scientists or scholars in this particular area. So I set out to work with other groups and organizations and institutions, not only to increase the number of indigenous research scientists, but also to bridge the gap in teaching non-native scientists on how to work with our communities. Because the question comes about from different people who ask me, well, why can't Native Americans just graduate high school and then go on to a tribal college or a community college and just go on to college. Why can't you just do that? And I say that it's a multifaceted challenge. And part of it is just this mistrust that we have with the US government, not only in the US, but in other countries as well. And so that's where I'd like to begin my story. We talk about Turtle Island and how North America was Turtle Island. All of it was indigenous territory. And long before the foreigners arrived, Turtle Island is in Navajo, which means the back of the turtle. So we must acknowledge, respect, and remember this fact. And we didn't come through the Bering Strait. We didn't come by boat. We were created here. And with our relatives to the north, they were creating each of their distinct homelands. And to our brothers and sisters to the south, they were also created there as well. So we have to take a, uh, a moment to think about that. But then people always push back and say, well, that's just an oral story. That has no validity. It doesn't count because it's not in written form. However, we've begun to push back. And Brian Brayboy, who's a Lumbee, indigenous scholar who's at Arizona State University pushes back by talking about using tribal, tri tribal critical race theory, tribal crit for short, by asserting that oral history and information is indeed a valid form of data. 
And so yesterday I was really happy to hear Christine talk about data sovereignty because that's the idea that this data is subject to the laws and governance of the nation where it is uh, collected. And so it's a pillar for Native American indigenous populations because it impacts indigenous sovereignty. So before we go any further, we have to go back to the roots of education in North America. So there were nine colonial colleges that were established, and only three called for the education of Indian youth, Harvard, the College of William and Mary, and Dartmouth. Of course, that mission was lost for several hundred years, but these institutions are doing their best to renew their commitment to these charter commitments. The challenge, though, was that with these institutions, they were set up by white European men for white European males. So from the get-go, it was white male patriarchy. So it was European heteronormative pedagogy. So anyone who's attended any institution in the US and in Canada, the roots go back to the mindset of a white male perspective. And because of that exclusivity and the fact that no one else could attend these schools, other colleges were established. Historically, black colleges and universities, women's colleges, religious colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, and then finally tribal colleges and universities. So we fast forward to today. More women than men are graduating from college. We know that. And for Native Americans, it's approximately 60% women and 40% men. But I do have to pause there and say, I am proud of our Native women and sisters for having the resistance and resilience to be successful. And I see that when I look at this audience now. So let's give them a round of applause. What I also do say is that I am proud of our Native brothers who are here, but we need more of our Native men to become part of this conversation. And there's a number of issues that lead to that, which led to this Men of Color in Higher Education project that I was a part of. And we published a book in 2014. We talked about all the things that were, we were facing, but then we started taking a look at what could help us. And those are cultural programs. Uh, for, for, for instance, with the, the Navajo Nation, there's a project called the Trache Project, which is the Sweat House Project, the Sweat Lodge Project. And so through that, it was helping young men and adolescent boys reconnect with cultural knowledge through language. And I just want to show this to you. At Harvard, there's a plaque dedicated to the Indian college that was there. And this was donated by Ray Halberter of the Oneida Nation in 1997. So this is Bilagan which means the white man's educational system. In essence, education was established in the US to Christianize us, to Christianize the infidels. And that was really what it was. So we have the impact of not only education, but also Christianity, historically, but also in contemporary times. And you've heard this before in other presentations, which led to the establishment of federal government boarding schools. Colonel Henry Pratt, whose infamous motto was to kill the Indian to save the man. And so again, I go back to the Harvard Indian College, which housed the, the, college, the college's first printing press. And that was where the first Bible in North America was printed, and the Bible was a translation into the Algonquian Indian language. So even there, you see where that precedent was set. And it was really the same ethos that guided the establishment of government and church-run boarding schools. So we take a look at this word cloud, and these are all the words that we use Removal, shame, loss, trauma, illness, abuse, boarding, family, gender, disease, language, school. So if you can imagine, just for a few seconds, being woken up, being roused out of bed, and I'm going to do this in Navajo for you. So what I said was, get up, 
get ready. You have to go to school. Can, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Don't you understand what I'm telling you? Now, f think about what's happening in our southern border where, there's, where there are children being separated and torn away from their families, and they're crying. Mama, Papa, ayúdame, ayúdame. Why is this happening? They don't know why they're being separated. So that's what our ancestors endured. That's what they experienced. So from there, there was that, that PTSD. And so how do you reconcile that? So you take a look at, these are Apache children who were forcibly removed, kidnapped basically, imprisoned in government boarding schools before and after. So this is what happened with a lot of our ancestors and our relatives. This is Bilagana Bizad, the white person's words, language. And this is where Spring asserts that as a result of globalizations and imperialism, indigenous peoples have been forced to undergo extreme cultural change resulting in many, and many becoming socially and psychologically dysfunctional. And this is where names are important. And someone in the audience talked about the way that we've been mislabeled. Well, first of all, we were mislabeled as Indians. We know that. And then we were mislabeled as, as, as Navajo people. We were mislabeled as Navajo. And to my understanding, the Navajo word means marauder. So it's used in the pejorative. But here's what people don't understand about any indigenous population. When you're under duress, when you're being attacked, you're going to defend. So we're warriors. We have male warriors. We have female warriors. We're protectors of our land. And that's why when you take a look at the percentage of the participation of people who joined the military, there's a higher percentage of Native Americans who joined the military because it's part of our DNA and who we are because we're defending our motherland. We're defending Turtle Island. That's where that comes from. And so, again, names are important. So that's how we, as the Navajo Nation, still use Navajo, but have owned it and said, this is who we are. But we're also talking about Dene, the people of the land. And so as education spread, as colonization spread, according to American history, the Indians moved west. We all came this way. Not by choice. Again, we were removed. And people don't understand that because, again, history is dictated by the people in power. So how many of you even remember reading about American Indians or Native Americans in US history books? Raise your hands. And how long was the depiction Half a chapter. <laughs> Over here, I see this much. Over here, it's this much. Over here, it was maybe a word or an intro or even a footnote. And on that note, for footnotes, there's usually an asterisk. So a group of scholars have been involved in developing an indigenous knowledge and sharing it with others from a pro-indigenous approach. And this is where people ask me, why are Native Americans so anti-science or anti-education? And I say, we're not anti-science, we're not anti-education. We just want a pro-indigenous approach. We want to democratize educational and scientific establishments and processes. But I show this graphic with you to, because of the fact that we've all experienced some sort of long walk or a trail of tears. And in Navajo, this is suffering is and our long walk we call and so these are also examples of how historical trauma impacted our ancestors and continue to have an impact on us today and the forced removal such as the genocidal and ethnocidal intent and annihilation or disruption to traditional life ways, cultures and identity I was part of a work group, oh, maybe seven or eight years ago. And the topic was health disparities. 
and the topic of obesity and diabetes came up. And I sat there and listened, and one of the researchers said, I just don't understand why there are high rates of obesity and diabetes in Native American communities. Don't they know how to eat? Don't they know how to exercise? Why can't they just go to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's and eat nutritional foods? And then why can't they just go to the gym and exercise? And if I was younger and thinner skinned, I probably would have reacted differently. So I said, let me clarify something for you. This community that we're talking about is located an hour away from the nearest town. And that town is a border town. So we also have a fixed income for a lot of these families. And this was a time period when, remember when gas is like four, five or six dollars a gallon? And then on reservations, it was even higher. So I said, think about that. This individual, this family has a fixed income. They have a certain amount of money that they can use to pay for gas, to go to the border town, to be treated disrespectfully, and to face racism and discrimination. And they can't buy all the fresh foods or foods and produce that their family requires because that money has to last, the food has to last. So therefore, they're buying processed foods. So that's the impact that colonization has had in our, on our communities because of the access that we had to traditional foods is no longer there. Plus the fact that for exercise, yes, we have our own concepts of exercise, but you're telling us that we should go to a gym. Well, we don't have gyms. We can't afford gyms. Yes, we can look at local schools on wellness programs, but this is also a community awareness endeavor. Hopefully that person walked away with a better sense of what our communities face. Which means this is not good, this is, not, this is harmful to our communities. So Walters and her colleagues found that historical trauma events that disrupt ties to family, community, or place, such as the boarding school, forced relocation, they may be associated with depressive symptoms and they cause direct physical harm to the community, the body, the land, our sacred sites. And in this time and with this current administration, we are facing reduction in our lands. I don't know how many of you heard about this, but the Mashpee Wampanoag were unrecognized. How many of you heard about that? So again, that's an encroachment of our tribal sovereignty. So this is all tied back to language and culture. Because once we no longer speak our languages, we're going to be just like anyone else. And with that is going to, one fell swoop of a pen, people are going to say, well, you're no longer distinct. You don't have a distinct language. You don't have a distinct culture. Why should you have sovereignty? Why should you have your own land? And that is inevitable if we lose our languages and cultures, but I have, I have hope. And that's why I'm here, and that's why you're here. And there are a lot of people who challenge language programs. I was working on a project as a, uh, in graduate school, and I was working with the, my own community, and I remember interviewing a community member who was also part of the educational system. And they said, what are your thoughts on Navajo language? He said, it's a lost, lost cause. We should even bother teaching it in our schools. And my researcher, who was um, from New Zealand, she had worked with the Maori people. And I felt her reaction. She was sitting to my right. And I said, OK. Again, I had to take notes with these uh, interviews. So we left. As we were driving away, she started crying. She said, I can't believe he just said that. And I said, well, th those are the challenges that we face. But this is also where internal oppression and internal racism comes about. And this is where we have to educate ourselves. We have to take responsibility and hold those others, our, our community members, accountable as well. Because our children have a right to speak their indigenous languages. It's their civil right. Why should we deny them that?
And this is also a communal effort. Not only is it going to be the responsibility of our, each of our tribal nations, but it's also our community leaders, our elders, and our schools. So Hartman and Gohn summarized the four C's, and and really colonial injury, collective experience of these injuries, the cumulative effects of these injuries, and then the cross-generational impacts of these injuries as legacies of risk and vulnerability that are passed on. And I'm gonna pause here again to give you an example of how we were deprogrammed and then reprogrammed, but we're lagging behind. Prior to the foreigners invasion, we had a base 10 system and in numbers, in, num in counting and so forth, in our math. And because we didn't use numerals, they thought we didn't know how to count or we didn't know how to, we didn't understand math. But we had a base 10. Now I'll give you an example. Two foreign. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Distinct numbers. And then in Spanish, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Okay. Now Navajo. Again, all distinct. Okay. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Spanish. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Um, Navajo. Slatsada, Nakitsada, Tratsada. Deeds other, Schlatz other, has trans other, say beats other. So it's other, say beats other, not eats other, not deen. So what's the root word in 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19? Teen. And then in Navajo, Schlatz other, Nakitz other, Tratz other, Tzada means 10. So, and then in Spanish, Vente uno, so you're basically saying 20 plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, so forth. That's all base 10. So we knew that traditionally. But then we were forced into these schools saying, you don't know that, so you're going to learn how to count our way. But had they had the wherewithal and foresight to say, well, actually, you already know this, but we'll just tell you this in a different way. So we already know math. We already know science. We just don't call it that. It's just part of who we are. And how does this tie back into the land base, Nehekeya? So we've suffered the loss of traditional homelands. And it's had an impact, not only the spiritual and physical relationships that we have. Uh, you take a look at what's happening with Bears Ears. There are indigenous peoples who need access to Bears Ears for ceremonies and prayers and offerings. And in some instances, we are being denied those rights to those sacred places. And these disruptions really cause this imbalance in our social and kinship relationships. And I'm not saying that we can go back to that time period where gender roles were more balanced, but we still have that cultural knowledge base within our communities. And how do we access that? We access that through language, through comprehension of language, through the passing on of stories. And I had a, who's heard of Tony Hillerman? Okay. How, how accurate do you think his depictions are? Maso menos, come see, come saw, right? A little, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But basically, I had a conversation with uh, a Latino colleague of mine who was married into one of the Pueblos, and, I, and the, his name came up in this conversation. I said, well, I don't really care for him because he gets things wrong and just perpetuates these myths about Native Americans. He said, I would agree, but my wife said that, who's Pueblo, uh, she 
doesn't mind if they get it wrong because what if they do get it right? Then that's access to cultural language, sacred knowledge. After that, I said, okay, Tony Hillerman can all write about all he wants in however way that he wants, as long as he doesn't get it right. And so not only is that happening for us here in the U.S., but also up in the north and to the south. And the word detech bekeya, the ne, is actually the, the land of the people who live with the moose. So that's how we refer to indigenous people up in Canada and in the northern territories. And they also experience the same thing with their Indian residential schools. And in addition, these children went missing. They were victims of all sorts of abuse, mental, physical, and sexual. And so findings have um, provided evidence that these survivors are more likely to suffer from a vari variety of mental and physical problems compared to those who did not attend these schools. And that's also happening in, um, has happened, and probably is still happening in other countries around the world namely in New Zealand and in Australia. I had the fortune of attending a, the Summer Institute for Native Americans in Genome Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle in July. It's, it's called SING for short, and uh, I, I had the fortune of talking about this with some of my uh, Maori relatives, and they also are reconciling this residential school experience. But people have begun to explore what is possible. And I put hajon nahasling, which means harmony and balance has been restored. And that's what we're working toward. And so Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart is one of the first to describe historical trauma for Native peoples. And she says we should draw from our traditional knowledge bases. And so according to researchers, we see that there are indigenous means of treatment. I heard yesterday, I believe it was, uh, the question was about how do you utilize both ways in which to address some of these issues. And it's, it could include language, the traditional foods, ceremonies, spiritual beliefs, history, story, songs. But all of that comes from language. And those are the challenges that we face. If we, I'm not saying we have all the answers and all the answers can be found, but certainly a hybrid approach in this day and age would be helpful to us. So the title for this is So foreigners working with Navajo or indigenous people, that's where we can find strength, that's where we can find some solutions, plausible solutions. And this is where the whole topic of epigenetics comes into play because of those stressors that our ancestors experienced. What they ate, what they saw, what they drank, what the, the air that they breathed, the trauma that they experienced could trigger some sort of predisposition or a signal to cause a predisposition for an illness or a disease or a condition that may be ongoing. And that's what our communities face. And so again, this is where I, I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be here because it allows for me to make connections with other people who are engaged in this work, to work collectively toward finding solutions to help our communities and the seventh generation as Oren Lyons has. So that's what we need to do. And so again, mind and body balance can occur through the healing process. Part of that healing process for, some, for our indigenous communities and populations. And really healing comes about from reconciliation and acknowledging something that went wrong. And in Australia, the Australian government apologized to the Aboriginal people. How many of you heard about this or are aware of this? Good. So the prime minister in 2008, over 10 years ago, acknowledge that for the stolen generations, for the pain, suffering, and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. 
That has also happened in Canada. This is a photo of one of the religious schools for indigenous people, for First Nations people. It was also over 10 years ago that the Prime Minister of Canada apologized to First Nations people. Far overshadowed by tragic accounts of the emotional, physical, and sexual abuse and neglect of helpless children and their separation from powerless families and communities. And so they've made that apology as well. Here's a photo of that occasion. Now, where do we go? Should we ask the US government for an apology? Should we demand one? We certainly deserve one, don't you think? Yes, I think so. So I've been working with the National Indian Education Association regarding how we can collaborate. And I just added the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition because there's another potential partner for me and collaborator. And how can we address this on the national scale? How do we do this with tribal communities? How do we address urban and reservation communities? How do we do that? But I do have to pause there and, and say, are we ready for this? Are our community members ready for this? Are we ready for an apology? Well, yes. But we received the classic non-apology apology. And this was back in 2009. Senator Brownback originally introduced the measure to officially recognize the past ill-conceived policies of the US government or native peoples. And then it was signed into law by President Obama, but it was watered down. It did not make a direct apology from the government, but rather apologizing on behalf of the people of the United States to all native peoples for the many instances of violence, maltreatment, and neglect inflicted on Native peoples by citizens of the United States. But the resolution also included a disclaimer, nothing in it authorizes or supports any legal claims against the United States, and the resolution does not settle any claims. So, sort of said, oh, kind of sorry, but not really. So we have no financial obligation for anything that's tied to the mistreatment and the injustice we've suffered for hundreds of years and in some instances still continue to suffer. So the National Indian Education Association passed a resolution in terms of establishing a commission on the federal Indian boarding school policy. So they want to create this commission to conduct a study nationally to plan, design, and carry out its work in collaboration with tribal people and communities and receive ver verbal and written testimony from boarding school survivors. And in their, 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 to my understanding, some of you have experienced boarding school experiences. And to take these recommendations from the people who suffered and had this experience and raising public awareness about this and recommending committee support for these culturally appropriate community-led remedies that lead, that include the participation of the survivors, families, native communities, and tribal nations. And this was passed in 2013. So with that, let's flip that downward arrow that I showed you the first time around. Let's turn it back up. Turn it around, because we can be in control of this. I talked about democratizing scientific research, any sort of research, taking the pro-indigenous research or approach to this. We own this, we can own this even more so. Because I look out and I see a lot of indigenous scholars who are interested in this. And I do have to say though that there was also the benefit of the government boarding school experience. For some individuals, this was a haven for some individuals, this was their only choice. And for some individuals, they were able to see and maintain a balance. And for some individuals, this led to their success in, in, in having a career. 
and has had an impact on families. And so personally, my mother went through this boarding school experience. And um, I tell her story because she was an activist before she was an activist. And she attended three government boarding schools and a parochial school. At each of the three government boarding schools, anytime she had, she had to choose a new one because she was labeled a problem child. Why do you think she was labeled a problem child? I see this. Any other guesses? She stood up for herself. She stood up for herself because she refused to stop speaking Navajo. She refused to stop being Navajo. And when she was getting ready to be passed on to the high school at the parochial school she attended, she was given a choice. She was told, OK, we want to promote you and move you on, but we're not going to do that unless you give up your language, your culture, everything that you believe traditionally, whatever it is that you believe. You leave it here, and we'll promote you. And she said, no. If this is what education is about, I'm not going to give it up. You can keep your education. I'm going to go on and see what I can do. So she went on to work in a school cafeteria. And after a 40-year career, at the end, she was the cafeteria manager. And that was a time when you could advance without a high school diploma or a college degree. But she thinks about that experience. And that's where the value of education was instilled in me. And um, sometimes she used to muse, I wonder what I would have done had I gone to college. I wonder where I would have been if I had graduated high school. I wonder what I could have done. And I tell her, that's OK, Mom, because those sacrifices that you made have allowed us to advance in education because I was able to grow up in a bilingual home. So I didn't really understand the importance of being able to speak the ne was when my late grandmother and I would have conversations. I visited her every once in a while. And she would tell me stories, but I couldn't ask questions because I wasn't fluent. That led me to study Navajo intentionally. So when I was at the University of New Mexico, I studied the Navajo language. And I'm now fluent. I can read it. I can write it. With that, I went back and had even more profound and meaningful conversations with my late grandmother. I'd ask her stories and our questions. And sometimes, when we were in a room and the conversation gravitated toward uh, English, she would say, Meaning, what in the world are you talking about? You're not white people. Oh, sure. You know, she kept us in check. And that's what my mother does with me as well. I come home and um, I'll be heading home in a couple of days. I certainly don't go home dressed like this. This is, you know what I wear at work. And um, if I do come home, she say, why are you so dressed up? Where are you going? Go chop some wood, go haul some water, go feed the sheep, go feed the animals. You're going to mess up your, your nice clothes, she tells me. So again, she keeps me in check. And so I'll conclude with a list of my references. And also, there are references within each of my slides. But I wanted to share with you the concept of hajan, where we go back to this wellness philosophy and the belief system that we have that includes principles that guides our thoughts, our actions, our behaviors, and our speech. And when I was thinking about what people were saying yesterday, the power of language is illustrated through the power of traditional prayer. I was at an indigenous conference 
over a decade ago. And we had an elder who gave a blessing. And at the end, he said, our ancestors prayed for a time when our children and our grandchildren would learn the ways of the, of the white people, their language, their customs. And the Creator has blessed us. And now our children and grandchildren know that. Now is the time for us to pray to the Creator for our children and our grandchildren to learn back our languages because that will determine our future. Thank you.